Hey guys, this is Soy from Channel Fred Raider. Just wanted to let you know you're watching part one of 107 Facts about Star Wars Episode 5. To see the rest of the facts, head on over to Cinematica, where we showcase the best in movies and television, just for you guys. Make sure to subscribe as well, or you can stick around until the end of the video, and there'll be an annotation that leads you to the exact spot in the video that you left off in the full video, so you can watch the rest of the facts that way. Let's get right to the facts! Film sequels are notoriously bad, so crushingly terrible, especially when the filmmaker is so suddenly powerful that he can do anything he wants, which George Lucas was, and then some. Yet he defined expectations and managed to avoid the sophomore slump. But that was no easy task, trust us. Think you know the whole story? Think again. I'm Rob at Cinematica, and we're here to give you the inside scoop on how George Lucas created what is widely regarded as the greatest sequel of all time, The Empire Strikes Back. So sit back, grab some snacks, because Cinematica is counting down the 107 facts you should know about Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, so you can watch smarter. 1. Lucas was always an independent filmmaker at heart. Following the massive, record-breaking success of the first Star Wars, he'd hoped to become independent from Hollywood by financing The Empire Strikes Back himself and with various loans. 2. Instead of directing, Lucas decided to oversee The Empire Strikes Back as a producer, focusing more on the groundbreaking effects produced by his company, Industrial Light and Magic. 3. Lucas asked his former film professor from the University of Southern California's School of Cinematic Arts, Irvin Kirshner to direct The Empire Strikes Back because of Kirshner's focus on characters. 4. Kirshner actually turned down Lucas at first, believing the sequel could never be as good as the original. Kirshner's agent demanded he take the job, however, and he relented. The decision changed his life. Kirshner would go on to direct huge Hollywood films like Robocop 2 and the James Bond film Never Say Never Again, among others. 5. Lucas's original screenwriter for Empire Strikes Back, Lee Brackett, died just one month after finishing her draft. 6. After Brackett's death, Lucas took on the screenwriting duties himself. This draft is also where Lucas first wrote that Darth Vader is Luke's father. 7. With encouragement from Kirshner, Lucas hired now legendary screenwriter Lawrence Kasdan to write the production drafts of the screenplay. Kasdan had just finished writing Raiders of the Lost Ark. 8. Even with a new screenwriter attached, Lucas was able to work in, well, steal elements of Flash Gordon just like he did in the original Star Wars. And The Empire Strikes Back, the most obvious homage is Cloud City, which is lifted directly from Cloud City in the film version of Flash Gordon. 9. The Luke-Leah romance was originally going to be much more prominent, with Luke flat out telling her that he loves her in the treatment. So it's likely at that point Lucas hadn't decided that they were siblings yet. I and mean, this is a Game of Thrones after all. 10. Tons of visuals and story points were also borrowed from the Akira Kurosawa masterpiece, The Hidden Fortress. Things like the beautiful but acerbic princess and her tough rescuer stuck behind enemy lines, helped along by two bumbling peasants, for instance. 11. Empire is the first Star Wars movie to have an episode designation, Episode 5, precede its title in the opening crawl. Studio executives would not let Lucas put Episode 4 before A New Hope, as they feared it would confuse the audience. 12. Empire takes place three years after A New Hope, which is the same amount of time between the releases of the two movies. 13. On a completely different note, some of the most legendary lines in the Star Wars canon were improvised, including this one. I love you. I know. Originally Han was supposed to say, I love you too, but Kirshner and Harrison Ford hated it, so according to Kirshner, he asked Ford to improvise something and the rest is Star Wars history. 14. Speaking of famous lines, what would you say is the single most quoted line in the history of Star Wars? Easy. Luke, I am your father. Right? And <laughs> Wrong. The line is actually... No. I am your father. 15. Darth Vader's meditation chamber is called a cabrat. 16. This movie marks the first appearance of the Imperial March, Darth Vader's legendary theme song. It plays with the reveal of Darth Vader's Super Star Destroyer. 17. Director Kirshner is widely credited with pushing Lucas in The Empire Strikes Back to focus more on the human elements of the story, like the love story between Han and Leia, and the mentor-mentee relationship between Yoda and Luke. Maybe this is why The Empire Strikes Back has the lowest body count of the entire Star Wars saga. Only 30 kills. 18. Jim Henson, a friend of George Lucas, was offered the role of Yoda. Busy with the great Muppet caper, Henson turned it down. He recommended Frank Oz for the role, who was ultimately cast. Oz is most famous as the voice of both Cookie Monster and Miss Piggy. 
19. Jeremy Bullock, who played Boba Fett, was cast solely because the costume happened to fit him perfectly. Much like quite a few other characters, he was cast because of his size. He didn't have to do a reading or a screen test in order to win the role. 20. Yafet Kodo was offered the role of Lando Calrissian. He turned it down because he believed he would be killed off and it would be difficult for him to find work after that. Billy D. Williams, who had previously auditioned for the role of Han Solo, then won the role. 21. Wedge Antilles was not originally scripted to appear in this film. It was out of an intense fan interest that prompted George Lucas to include him. In a weird bit of six degrees, Dennis Lawson, who played Wedge Antilles, is Ewan McGregor's uncle. Ewan McGregor, as you know, plays the young Obi-Wan Kenobi in episodes 1, 2, and 3. 22. Due to a recent eye operation during principal photography, it was unclear if Sir Alec Guinness would return as Obi-Wan Kenobi. He finally did agree and worked just one day on the film. Arriving on set at 8.30 a.m. and wrapping by 1 p.m., he was paid a quarter of a percentage point of the film's gross, which ended up being worth millions of dollars. 23. Principal photography lasted over 180 days, the longest shoot of any of the Star Wars movies. It was beset with delays in part because of the Norwegian weather, and in part because of the special effects were often filmed in camera. 24. While filming in Norway, they encountered the worst winter storm in 50 years, and on occasion the crew were unable to exit their hotel. The scene where Luke wanders through the snow after escaping the Wampa Cave was shot by sending Mark Hamill outside into the cold while Kirshner and the cameraman filmed from inside the hotel's front hall. 25. Mark Hamill wasn't the only cast or crew member put to the test. John Barry, who had won an Academy Award for his production design on the first Star Wars, sadly collapsed on set and died, struck with undiagnosed meningitis. 26. Episode 5 introduces us to the cult hero, bounty hunter Boba Fett. Updated versions of the original Star Wars, however, remember, Lucas likes to tinker, contained a digitally added Boba Fett en route to meeting Jabba the Hutt. He stops and looks directly at the camera in the most recent special edition of the original for reasons no one is really sure of. 27. Boba Fett was such a small character that his first appearance was in the Star Wars Holiday Special, not in the original Star Wars. In fact, he only has four lines in the original trilogy and we never see his face. Yet somehow he has become a beloved character in the Star Wars canon. 28. Lucas and Star Wars had some famous fans. Stephen King visited the set while The Shining was filming next door. He must have been impressed by director Irving Kirshner, who was nicknamed Kirsch because King would later name a character Mrs. Kirsch and have her speak in a similar pattern to Yoda. More on that later. One important distinction, Mrs. Kirsch was a witch who terrorized little kids. Kirshner, by all accounts, was a nice guy. 29. But maybe Stephen King was taking a jab at Kirshner after a fire on the set of Empire destroyed some of the sets for The Shining. Lucas and Kirshner actually had to donate some of their allotted space so The Shining could keep filming. Thanks for watching this part one of 107 Facts about Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back. To watch the rest of the video, make sure to subscribe to Cinematica. See you for the next one.